So precious Father, we come before your throne. We come under the government of your name in the spirit of brokenness. And as we wait upon your holy majesty, we ask that Lord you will make bare the testimony the oracles of your spirit that tonight there will be a furnishing of the life, the nature and the power of your son, the Christ and the least one among us will become as strong as David weaknesses be swallowed up that we may look upon you as you are that will be changed so that from among us mighty men will rise men that can look through the veil draw wisdom, draw insight draw ideas inspiration and empowerment to navigate the treacherous path of life and provide witness sufficient to advance the frontiers of your kingdom Help us tonight and take all the glory in Jesus' precious name. In Jesus' precious name. Tonight is a privilege to be here to share with us briefly the word of the Lord before my father comes up. First time I had the privilege of standing in for him. I knew what it meant for a man to require the help of God. And tonight, we have to minister in his presence. Trust that the Lord will grant sufficiency in the name of Jesus. We've been on this mountain for more than 24 hours. And the word of law of the Lord has been coming so sharp and so heavy. And tonight I want to add another layer at least the much I've learned trusting that someone will be built up in the course of this meeting tonight and the name of the Lord be glorified daddy began to emphasize the necessity of being planted in the spirit The significance of being planted in the courts of God and in the house of God. Because of the magnitude of challenge and attack that the believer and the body of Christ is facing at this time. The subject of maturity and establishment, the subject of stature cannot be overemphasized. A man's health can be attacked and by the instrumentality of the anointing it can be handled. By the instrumentality of faith it can be handled. A sinner can be won over by a good gospel in, in a field. So the greatest challenge of the body are not things that have to do with our earthly realities. And so most times when the devil wants to truncate the heritage of God that is committed to a generation, what he does is that he opens the gate of error. The gate of error transcends a generation. When the gate of error is open, they can sweep off an entire generation and the generations after. And the heritage of God can be lost. The gifts of the spirit can be in motion. The manifestations of the spirit can be in motion. But a generation will be walking in the direction of error. And they will be separated completely from the commonwealth of Israel. So at a strategic time like this, God raises custodians. Men that can bring the body back to alignment. So that they walk in the path of spiritual progress. 
this is one of the greatest responsibility of the apostolic office and most times when God raises a man to defend the integrity of God a generation can misunderstand him because it's not a business of babes it's a reality that flows from the economy of God part time and only men that are brought to a point of understanding the present revelation position of the spirit we know that this is not a display of pride or a showcase of knowledge is a defender of the heritage of God. In Jeremiah chapter 13 verse 23 to 25. Nehemiah 13 verse 23 to 25. Nehemiah stood up to defend the heritage of God that was committed to the children of Israel. And at some point he had to punch some of them in the face. Because lascivious living became the order of the day. Men marrying strange tribes and bringing strange gods into the house of God and a defender had to rise this is why sometimes you look as if you are attacking it's not an attack it's a fight to defend the heritage of God committed to a generation Jude will say there are many crept in among us that have turned the grace of God onto lasciviousness but to defend this heritage of God, he said, it's important for us to fight for the faith that was once committed to us. The job of defending the faith is beyond the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit. The job of defending the heritage of God committed to a generation is beyond being known and being popular. Most times, there are only a handful and the apostles that God raised and commits this body into their hands, their lives, the dealings of God in their lives becomes a testimony of the faithfulness of God because their lives become a story that God tells from heaven. And any generation that lacks gatekeepers is a generation that is already in error. So Papa began to emphasize and he told us, we don't even love the word of God anymore. In the days of Paul, Paul was teaching into the night and Eutychus fell down and died. He went down, brought him back to life and continued teaching. There was an emphasis, there was something that must be defended. Death is not enough to distract what Paul was doing. He said in Acts chapter 19 from verse 9 to 10, how that he stood and debated and persuaded and argued and disputed with the people in a bid to defend the heritage of God and a point came Paul had to separate the believers you know there's a place where you talk unity there's another place where you have to separate some people so that the heritage of God can be preserved it may look as if you are creating disunity you are fighting to defend the faith And it's a burden for our generation. Every one of us must be taught the act of being skillful with the word of God. Not just to teach it, but to internalize it until it becomes our life. So Papa would say, it's not being about being revelatory, but being exemplary. In Acts chapter 1 verse 2, he said, of all that Jesus both began to do and to teach. A generation must be equipped to stand and to defend the integrity of God but this is lacking in our time we are carried away by mundane things every day we come to church it's about prophecies prophecies we don't fight against it but the idea is are you going to live by bread alone so Papa said our generation is dwarfed it's a generation of babes a consumer generation a consumer generation. There are no men of stature that can rise up in God because they have aligned to the dealings of his spirit. So we cannot give expression to the bodies in the heart of the father. David will say the sacrifices of a broken heart 
and of a contrite spirit. The Lord cannot despise because there is a soul structure. There is a soul disposition a man must attain before he can stand before this immortal deity. Before you can give expression to the life force of this being that dwells in the womb of light. That sits in the midst of the coals of fire. There is a sacrifice. Something must happen to that man until he's broken enough and his, the boundaries of his soul can accommodate God and express him. This is what is lacking in the body of Christ. Many gifted men, but you can't find Christ in their lives. So we little men in the market, little men in governmental front, but Jesus cannot be seen. So a new order must rise and exodus from people of flesh into men of the spirit through instructions and empowerment that will bring the life of the Christ quicken him on our inside until we can defend him even if we have to die Jesus said this commandment have I received of my father this commandment I have learned how to lay down my life and to take it up again we have not come to that point where we know God for who he is enough to say if only in this life we have hope we are four men most miserable we live for bread and wine and he said the first thing that must happen to us is that we must come into vital intimacy and relationship with the Holy Ghost because if we don't he said we are orphans orphans so many are orphans many don't know the voice of God many have never heard God so all they live for is their appetites. He say a man in honor that knoweth not is like the beast of the field that perishes. How do beasts live? They live for their emotions. They are driven by their emotions, their feelings, and their desires. But there's a place a man can walk into that he will journey past the veil of mundanity and enter into the womb of the spirit. It is the body of the now that every one of us must be established in the courts of God so that we can give expression to his multifaceted dimensions our lives must become a witness of god we have been christians for many years but if you are touched and you are asked today what aspect of god do your life give expression to you'll be amazed that all we have are titles we don't have men that walk in the spirit but from the days of the patriarch they knew that life is not life except you have fraternized with the spirit enough to give expression to his reality. Everything you do will count for nothing. Because when the immortals check you out, it is the God factor in your life that you give expression to that they will look upon. The ways of God that your life has been able to mirror, that is what will give you value in the courts of heaven. That's why in the law, in the in the in the in the hall of fame, Adam's name was not there. Because there was no dimension of God that his life pioneered or represented. He was the first man created. But when he was traced, there was no dimension of God that could be traced to him. And when the Bible came to Abel, he said, Abel gave a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. So the life of Abel in the spirit realm is sacrificed. And the patterns that those elders put in motion, when Jesus showed up, he followed those patterns. Because they are called patriarchs. The reason is because they caught a dimension of God and they gave expression to it. Abel's life was a life of sacrifice. And it was through Abel's life that we realized that it is possible for blood to have utterance in the courts of heaven. So after Jesus perfected and attained the, the claims of divine justice, the reason the blood of Jesus was to be carried to the Holy of Holies was because Abel had pioneered that pattern. That the blood can be a testament in heaven. So he's a patriarch. He said, Noah, being warned of God, move with fear. So the life of Noah was a revelation of reverence. <laughs> reverence was what his life echoed in heaven. So every time the lifestyle, the doctrine, the, the understanding of reverence is to be preached in heaven, Noah will rise up like a monument. For eternity, he's the symbol of reverence in the courts of God. Abraham, 
the Bible said was rich in cactus, in gold and in silver. The Lord had blessed him in all things. But when the records of Abraham were to be read, everything he had was not mentioned. Because all of those things are mundane. They have value in time. But in the realm of kings, when the chronicles are read, the things you have in time don't count. Cactus, gold and silver are not numbered. So this man know the way of stature. What gave Abraham stature? He was tested and he became a symbol of faith. So Abraham pioneered the way of faith. And God tested him many times. Until even the eyes God gave him, he was willing to give him up. So the Bible said, Abraham, on the mountain of God, the Lord shall be seen. So it was Abraham that encapsulated a dimension of God called the El Shaddai. And the El Shaddai is not the provider. The El Shaddai is upon the mountain of God, it can be seen. And much more than that, the El Shaddai means the mountain one. So Abraham learned how to mount God. So every time Abraham wants to bring witness on earth, he knows how to mount God. The mountain one. That's what Abraham found in the spirit. And he entered there by the pathway of sacrifice and faith. But our Christianity today is judged by the number of black jeeps we have with tinted glasses. Hey, uh. Ah, 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 God bore him testimony. He said, I know Abraham, my servant, for he will teach his children to walk in my ways. His children and his household. That was a pattern he mirrored. Many years later, even the sons of Keturah were priests. More than 800 years later, when Moses caught a body to pursue after God, it was Jethro that taught him the way of God. The name Jethro is not his real name. That's his title. His name is Ruel. That means the friend of God. So the blueprint of Abraham remained in that generation for many hundred years. And it was the, he was the one that taught Moses how to walk with God. There were men that learned how to detach themselves from this world so that their lives can become witnesses of the divine. Every time you touch them, you touch the dimension of God because they know him and they've seen him as he is. So John showed up. He said that which was from the beginning, which our eyes have seen, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. That is what we have come to commit to you. What is it that was from the beginning? It is the fellowship of the Godhead, the koinonia of the divine. Because before creation began, the Father looked upon the Logos. And there was a communication between the Father and the Logos. The Logos looked upon the Spirit. There was a communication. That intensity of life, that vibration that flowed between the Godhead was what created, orchestrated, and motivated the creation of man. So when John said, I am bringing you what was from the beginning, he was bringing you back into the Spirit. Because in this world you can't live. You can only live when you reconnect to that koinonia that was before time began. That's when life begins. And it's the body of the apostolic. The body of the father for every generation. That is children we learn how to walk in the spirit. To walk in the spirit. Today we are religious men. At best we are given to programs, activities and titles. But there are few that walk in the spirit. Is a burden of the now. That which was from the beginning. How much of that fellowship do you have? Paul said the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Spirit be with you. This is why life begins from the Spirit. The witness of God is lacking. And a generation must make up their minds. To present the witness of God again. How much of the witness of God does your life represent? 
That's where Christianity begins from. It doesn't matter if you're an apostle. It doesn't matter if you're a prophet. It doesn't even matter if you're a believer. It is the quality of the witness of God that your life can present by time that determines your value in the courts of God. I came from the faith college. And when I heard Papa for the first time talking, I said, what is this? What do you mean? What are you trying to say? Are you trying to say everything we are doing is not correct? You see, you can argue when it's mental. But when you enter the spirit realm, argument ends. The reason we argue so much is because we don't know the spirit realm. <laughs> you see, there are pillars, there are invisible pillars upon which a people are built. Israel was built on invisible pillars. In Romans chapter 9 verse 4, the Bible said, Who are the Israelites? Who are they? Who are these people? Who are the Israelites? And he began to tell us who Israel is. Israel is built on a covenant, on a principle. There are pillars upon which that nation stands. And he said, unto whom pertaineth the adoption. These are the ones that God called to be his people. And the glory, and the covenant, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises. This is what Israel is. But it's not enough to know this. Because there is a life force that brings you into the glory. There is a life force that brings you into the covenant. There is a life force that brings you into the experience of the adoption. There is a life force that brings you into the experience of the law. For example, Moses walked in a way that a point came. Moses, the laws of God became the laws of Moses. That means there was a life that powered Moses. And in 2 Corinthians 3 18, Paul will now say, When Moses is read, Moses had become the law. Every other Israelite can know the law and cram it and recite it. But Moses is the law. He said, When Moses is read, so if Moses shows up, it's an embodiment of the law. Did you also read that when Moses stayed in God's presence for a long time, as he showed up, the Bible said, he wished not that his face shone like the sun. So Moses also became a carrier of the glory. That's why the Bible said the Israelites knew the acts of God, but Moses knew the ways of God. One of them know about, another one know. There's a difference between Moses and Kinosko. There's a man that knows about, but there's a man that embodies. There's a life force that brings you into the experience of the reality. This is what Christianity is about. Giving expression to divinity in the mortal vessel. But there is a, a protocol of the spirit that brings you into that dimension. Papa was telling us about the 12 pillars of the faith. The prophecies. The virgin birth. The death. The resurrection. The burial. The ascension, the enthronement, all of these things form the faith and they have their significances. For example, if you know about the prophecies, then you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Because it is the prophecies that the patriarchs gave that validated the person of the Christ because they knew a Messiah was coming. So everything Jesus did, you hear that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, that it might be fulfilled. So Jesus' life sustained a prophetic disposition because that was the validity of his claim to be the Son of God. If you knew about the incarnation, then you will know that Jesus is the Son of God. If you know about the virgin birth, then you will believe in the potency of the blood. Because the blood of Jesus had no connection with Adam. It is the blood of God. If you know about the cross, then you die to sin. If you know about the barrier, then everything about this world, you die to it. If you know about the resurrection, then you come into the newness of the life. Of life. If you know about the ascension, then you have advantage in warfare. And you can win and express your calling. You see the reason a lot of people ask, who am I? Am I a prophet? Am I an apostle? Because they've not caught the revelation of the ascension. Because it is when he ascended that he gave gifts unto men. If you know about the enthronement, then you will walk in the fullness of the spirit. Because when he ascended, when he was enthroned, Peter said, this same Jesus that you crucified is today exalted as Lord and Christ. That was what made for the release of the Holy Ghost. So Jesus said, he was speaking of the spirit which had not yet been given because Christ had not yet been glorified. So when you see a man struggling to receive the Holy Ghost, it means he has not gotten the revelation of the enthronement. 
beautiful as all of this ah you can recite it put it all your life but you will not have the experience there's a protocol that every believer must give himself to in order to walk into this economy there's a place in the spirit where you know about the blood there's a place in the spirit where you know about the power of the cross this is why you can quote the scripture yet live in sin there's a protocol and this is what Paul established everywhere he went to. These kinds of doctrine are no longer taught in the church. I want to use the next 10 minutes to show you the protocol of walking in the spirit. Because except you are planted in the house of God, you have no value in the kingdom. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1 He said therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ listen now the major things the fivefold do aside the other things we do is to establish Christ in your life he said in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 to some he gave to be apostles, evangelists prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints the word perfecting is the word equipping with light and the idea, the goal, is that we come into the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. So Paul was showing us the protocol for entering into the fullness of the measure of Christ. That's what he calls the principles of Christ. The word principle is from the word principal. This is the most cardinal for everybody who wants to walk in the spirit. And the first thing Paul outlined. He said, remember, if you, if you go down to verse 3, Paul will say, if God permit, we will lay it again. The reason he's saying, I will not lay this again is because I have laid it before. So everywhere I go to, the first thing I do is to lay this foundation. Apostle will tell us that the hardest thing to do is to, is to pastor Kana people. You want to make your job easy, teach them how to walk in the spirit. So everywhere Paul goes, his first priority is to teach the people how to walk in the spirit. And in verse 1, the first thing Paul said was repentance from dead works. Dead works are not just the works of the flesh. They are beyond the list in Galatians 5, 19 to 22. Everything you do that is motivated, inspired, and powered by the flesh is dead works, including preaching. This is why we do a lot of activities, but we have no territorial power. Because the devil thrives on the strength of your flesh. So if you are doing what you are doing by the flesh, you are empowering spirits other than God to have dominion over people. This is why we are in church, we are masturbating. We are in church, we are fornicating. We hear the message, but they come from the power, the energy of the flesh. Everything motivated by the flesh is dead works. So Paul said the first thing to do to walk in the spirit is repentance from dead works. The word repentance in this context is beyond confessing sins. I know a lot of us, we sin, we go and cry and then we feel a bit, you know, there is this relief. That's biochemical process. That's why if your relative dies, when you cry for two days, you become okay. The word repentance means turn around. What it means is migration from flesh to spirit. This is why repentance is only possible when you receive an encounter with the world. It's a conviction that does not only stop you from what you are doing, but empower you to do the other. What ought to be done? Sometimes it's not even from dead works. Sometimes it's from where you are currently operating in God to a higher platform. John said, I was in the Isle of Patmos for the testimony of the world and for the kingdom. And I heard the voice behind me as of a trumpet. And as I turned, as I turned, when John turned, he entered into the economy of Alpha Omega. He entered into a circumference of life that flesh cannot compromise. Walking in the spirit starts 
from an ambience where repentance is possible. This is why the first on the corridor of recovery is intercession. There are things you can never achieve unless you come within the perimeter of the life of God. That's where that word comes to you. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. I heard the voice. That's the only time you can turn around. When you have an encounter with that voice. The reason you will struggle again and again is that you are trying to achieve something with tools that are already corrupt. Your flesh is already compromised. So you are using your will. You are using your abilities. You are using your mind that is already compromised. Every time we want to begin to walk in the spirit or teach a generation to walk in the spirit, we bring them the way of intercession. You will stay there until you hear for yourself and you turn around. There are many that have never turned around. You have never turned around. You have done activities. You have been excited. You have fallen in church. You have cried. But you've never turned around. Because you've not stayed there enough. This is where life in the spirit begins. And that's why every time you want to create that atmosphere that warrants a turn around, flesh begins to fight. You lock yourself in your room. You are praying. The next thing you go and open your pot. You come and open the window. What you are doing is that flesh wants to be fed. But what men that turn around do is that they stay there. They stay there. Then the economy of migration begins. Because it's a day that wait upon the Lord. Isaiah 40 verse 31. They mount up with wings like the eagles. The devil is roaring, roaming like a roaring lion. Looking for whom he will devour. So the devil is characteristic of a lion. That devours the things of God. And the only way to kill the lion is to starve him. You can't fight a lion. You starve him. So what we do in the presence is that we starve flesh until the devil loses power and when you begin to starve the flesh starve the flesh starve the flesh then the second protocol is activated Paul calls it faith towards God you know what that is <laughs> the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God and the word of God in Matthew 13 is likened to a seed the word seed used in that scripture is the word spelma that's what you call spermatozoan in biological science. That means as you turn around, then that word inseminates your spirit. That word is planted in your spirit. And then it begins to germinate something. And that thing that is formed in you shall be called the son of the highest. When that word is planted, what happens is that a dimension of God is activated on your inside. That dimension, that anointing, that empowerment begins to draw you. That's what he calls faith toward God. Is the insemination of your spirit man by a word that comes particularly to you and begins to grow on your inside. That's why we live from inside out, not outside in. Most times we come to church, they worship, they dance it. We stage it in a beautiful way so that we can stay our emotion. But spiritual men don't gain excitement from outside. He say in the quietness. When you are still before the Lord, the joy of God flows from your inside. He said, be anxious for nothing, but in all things, by prayer and supplication, let the peace of God that surpasses understanding garrison in your heart. So, it's a style, it's a way of life that causes eternal life to gain momentum from the inside. We are not taught the path of progress. Most of us live in this world. We don't create an atmosphere of the spirit. And every time you struggle in this world, you will lose. Because you don't fight an enemy on his own plane. When the eagle wants to kill a snake, he picks it and takes it to the sky. That's why everything we read, we want to wow people that we have knowledge. Yet what we are saying, we don't do. Because we don't know it. The only way we can know it is if it's revealed in the presence. When God inseminates your spirit with his word, that word comes to you and suddenly you are changed into another man. The patriarchs of old know this. That's why they don't struggle. When you hear Moses go to wait for 40 days, he knows without that waiting, he is nothing. You hear again and again the prophets who say, the word of the Lord came to me. And the word of the Lord came to me. And the word of the Lord came to me. Sometimes they stay for many days. 
Ezekiel laid on one side of his body for more than 300 days and he turned to the other side and laid for another 40 days. Walking in the spirit is not by impartation. It's a part of life. Are you seeing why we are struggling? Because we don't know the way of the patriarchs. We don't respect the patterns that they pioneered. You don't know why a man in the Old Testament will walk like a New Testament believer. It's an order. Rapture. Even we now who are after the resurrection of Christ, we have not experienced it. But there's a man in the Old Testament that have walked in it. These are dispensational realities, but there are certain true intimacy. They have breached the gap and entered. The Bible says Enoch, who was seven, after Adam, the guy did not just know he would be raptured. He was saying, telling everybody, I will be carried. God loves me. I have pleased God. Is that, is that a man? The Bible says he walked with God and was not. Elijah walked in it until Elijah knew the location where the whirlwind was coming to. He knew. He knew the place. He's not trial and error. He knows the map of the spirit realm. So he can walk through four cities and go to the location. He had to cross a Jordan River to the location where he will be carried. And you, you come and say, I have the Holy Ghost. I have the Holy Ghost. And you are sleeping with your Holy Ghost. <laughs> Ah, who has bewitched us? We live like Kana men and we want to walk in the spirit. He said, The Kana man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, neither can he know it. You can't know it when you are sense ruled. He said, They are spiritually discerned. Faith towards God. How much of the world have you incubated in? And he said, when you achieved it, then you enter the doctrine of baptisms. <laughs> baptism in this context is not just the legalistic baptism. Where you are baptized in water or where you are told that you are baptized into the body of Christ. Remember, what Paul was teaching is establishment. It's how to bring men into perfection. It's how to establish Christ in them. So what Paul was referring to vitally here as baptism is further and continuous immersion in light this is why the apostles they went out with the gifts of the spirit and boldness until they were called and flogged and beaten and boldness was punctured and something happened the bible said they went back to their own company and lifted up their voices and prayed in one accord and something happened he said they were the place where they were was shaking and they were filled with the holy ghost again this is another immersion and a continuous immersion in the presence. Every time flesh wants to resurrect, you will go for further baptism. Papa will tell us heart check. Once every three months, you run 10 hours. What you are waiting for, you are not going to tell God to give you something. You are going back to be further immersed. Because sometimes you are drained. It's like the waters of Exesia in Exodus 47. You will get to a point where it's at the ankle. You will wait. They will pour a thousand cubits. It will be at the knee. They will pour a thousand cubits. It will come to your waist level. They will pour a thousand cubits. It will come here. And then the point comes to begin to swim. That's when you can go out again. Baptism. Submission. Immersion. In light. Continually. The fathers of old knew this. Again and again. You hear Moses go under the cloud. Again and again. To remain vital connected and relevant in the equation of God, there must be continuous baptism. You are immersed continuously. This is where we shut down and go back to seek his face. Activity will drown us. And I'm telling you because I am a victim of the same. Youthful exuberance, passion and zeal will drown. You will become dry, you will not know. Then the prince of this world will come again. And then he will find something. He will find something. He will find something. He will find something. That which was not there before, he will find it. The Bible spoke about Jesus. He said early in the morning, he went to a solitary place. There he prayed. The disciples thought it was normal activity. Until one day in Matthew 17 verse 2, they followed him. And while he was praying, the Bible said the fashion of his countenance was altered. 
That was when they saw the things that happened to him every time. And the reason he must go to a solitary place. Most times the Bible will say Jesus came and entered into the mountain. Do you enter into a mountain? He doesn't climb. That's telling you there is something happening beyond the physical mountain. He was entering into the presence. Submerged continually. Baptism in light. Continuous immersion for empowerment and for invigoration. And Paul said, when you begin to enjoy this baptism, something happened. At that point, God can trust you. And he began to speak of the laying on of hands. This is beyond the laying on of hands of the presbytery. It was Paul that laid hands on Timothy. But Paul told Timothy to go and find it to flame. That means after the presbytery have laid hands on you, there is a lifestyle you must sustain. It's called in 1 Peter 5, 6, come under the mighty hand of God. This is where government begins. The reason we are lawless is because we have not traveled beyond repentance. We have not traveled beyond faith towards God. We have not traveled beyond baptisms in light. So we are still full of ourselves. We have not come under the mighty hand. That's why Paul said we are the circumcision. That worship God in the spirit. Rejoicing in Christ Jesus. Having no confidence. I have come to a point where I have tried everything. It doesn't work. So I stay under the mighty hand of God. Sometimes God will create circumstances that will chisel you. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 8. That they were in despair. Beyond death. That was when they learned how to trust. That's the mighty hand of God. He comes upon a man perpetually and then he causes that man's soul structure to be reconfigured so that he can align with his government. Walking in the spirit is not a gift. It's a responsibility of the believer. How much of the government of God have you allowed over your life? And then we wake up all of a sudden, we think things will begin to happen. This is not a gift issue. This is how men gain stature and rank in the spirit. Every man of stature, check his life. There are badges. One of them is death. There are scars, trials that they went through because God will not show mercy. He will keep his government on them until they pass that class. You can repeat one class for a lifetime. But what God wants to achieve is to give you ranking in eternity. Because when we get to eternity, it's not the finished works of Christ that we re re translate to reward. It's our own works in the spirit. So God will not remove his hand. He will keep it there until you accept government. The government and the governance of the spirit. He will come upon you day and night. Some of you, for many seasons, God will tell you, wake up in the night. If you allow that season pass, he will wait for your cycle again after three years. And when he comes back, he will still tell you, wake up at night to pray. You can't move forward until you pass that class. It's called the laying on of hands. Coming under the mighty hand of God. So that in due time, he will exhort you. That exhortation is what Paul called resurrection from the dead. It's a migration from the land of the living to the land of the immortals. It's coming alive from the habitation of cruelty and walking in the spirit like one of the ancients. This is where the men of old walked in. A point came. Paul said, I don't know whether I'm in the flesh or in the spirit, but I knew that I was carried to the third heavens. I have left the world. I am no longer pegged to this world. I have stayed under the mighty hand of God until I know what is called ascension. I talk from heaven. The witnesses I bring to you is not necessarily a function of what I read. That's why a point came. He said, I am a man trustworthy. So concerning virgins, I have no instruction from the Lord, but I have seen the culture and the lifestyle of heaven. So I can tell you how virgins will live. I can tell you how men should live. I have been there. I have been there. The man knows experientially what resurrection from the dead is. As we are on earth, there are men that go to heaven. There was Papa that was telling us that you can train your gift and you can pick signals in the spirit. It doesn't mean you are an elder. You know what elders do? They go to heaven. So they hear the counsel in the council of heaven. So many things happening. They can tell you the tributary that carries the blessings of God. Abraham sat at 
about his gate. And you need to know that the gate is the office of the watcher. He sat there and he saw three men by the gates of Mambri. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 18, the gate of Mambri is where his altar was erected. So when those men landed, he knew that these ones are not mortals. And after God dealt with his problems and God was going, they began legislation. Abraham never gave a word of knowledge, but God himself called him a prophet. I know how these things work. And Abraham was bargaining the fate of a nation. That man is bigger than a nation because he understands business of stature. He understands the game of rank in the spirit. While others are pursuing things, Abraham pursues inheritance. That's why for the sons of Keturah, he gave gifts. But for Isaac, he gave an inheritance. So when Abraham pursues God and is journeying from the land, looking for a city with foundation, whose maker is God, he is pursuing something in the spirit. And for that, even after trusting God for many years, 25 years for Isaac to be born, and many years later, God will say, bring Isaac, he will take Isaac. Rank is a function of sacrifice. Our generations have, have not traveled far. We live, we live doing business in the flesh, pursuing things that even the unbelievers don't need to pray for. All our testimonies are breakthroughs. Their job opportunities, their careers. How many of these things does Dangote children pray for? It shows you how mundane we are. But they are men that pursue God for rank. They pursue God for stature. The Bible spoke of David. David hid himself in God perpetually. A point came, God wanted to take everything. He said, take not thy Holy Ghost from within me. How did he know that a believer can have the Holy Ghost in the Old Testament? He was fighting for stature. So when David came to the battlefield, Goliath was six feet tall. You think Goliath is a giant? Goliath is a dwarf before David. The Bible said the righteous shall be as tall as the cedars of Lebanon. The cedars of Lebanon is 120 feet tall. So Goliath was a dwarf before David. And the reason the cedars can grow that tall is because their roots go as far as 300 feet. He has stayed on that government. So he knows what it means to be ascended. And when you do that, God says he brings you into the eternal judgments of God. The eternal judgments of God is not necessarily the white throne judgment. It is a place of accuracy. He said, when the spirit of the fear of the Lord shall come upon him, he shall be made to be of a quick understanding. He shall not judge after the sight of his eyes or the hearing of his ears. This man has come to a point where he can mingle with the mortars to a degree that he knows the mind of the Father. That's the judgment of God. He can sit in the council of God. He has become one among the mortals. When John was carried to heaven, the angel trafficked him in heaven. He wanted to worship the angel. The angel said, no, I am like one unto your brethren. The guy is as ranking as one of the angelic entities. But he's a product of stature. And Paul said, when we have attained this, then we can touch the powers of the age to 